The things that I'm going to share with you, some people, as we know already, we, you know, this is a time of reconciliation. It's something that even the Vatican has been working on with the three monotheistic religions, the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians as well. But I'm going to share with you, those of you that do not know me that might be here, uh, I'm with Israeli News Live. We have an independent uh, news organization. We're both in the United States and in uh, uh, Europe as well. And we have roughly about a half million viewers a day. So we reach a long way. And besides covering the news, we cover the Middle East news between my wife, my father-in-law, we have about six languages in our family, Russian, Hungarian, Czech, Slovak, Hebrew, a little bit of everything. So we cover the Syrian conflict quite very much in depth. And I will be gentle with you. My wife will probably not be so merciful when she's up next. Uh, but uh, she also has her own private YouTube channel called Rise Up Children of God, which you'll be blessed by. She does a lot of our interviews, even for Israeli News Live, because she's smarter than I am. So, you know, you have to have girls for this. But today I'm going to be talking to you about what I call prophetic warnings. And when I say prophetic warnings, it's because as the Lord deals with me, He reveals all kinds of things to me. I am Jewish by my parents. My father was a Sephardic Jew. My mother is an Ashkenazi. And so as far as my background, I am Jewish in my background. I was actually the first believer uh, to actually believe that Yeshua was the Mashiach in my family. And uh, so it's a little different there. But there's a lot of things that I see more so from the aspect of being Jewish that I want to share with you today. Now I'm going to quickly just share with you some photographs here that I want you to think about. This here is uh, Pope Francis just in the building next door, the upper room above King David's tomb in 2014. This is a very familiar picture that we see uh, a lot of pictures like this on the news uh, in Israel since the third Antifada. And I can certainly understand what it's like to go through an Antifada in 2004 by the grace of Hashem up here uh, on, near French Hill, I was walking with the young lady that was brainwashed into doing an act of terrorism. And as I walked down the sidewalk with her, the Lord sent an angel that says to me, turn around and go the other way. Didn't say why. I didn't like the idea that I had to go the other way because I didn't like the other way. But right when she blew herself up, it put a wall between me and her because I obeyed that voice that I heard that spoke to me. So uh, I understand. I have a heart for the Palestinian people, though, as well, because I feel like that they have been duped into a lot of things that are happening to them today that we'll talk about in a moment. Mekodeshit is something that the Vatican started here uh, last year in 2016. It was the trial run and, uh, and the, there's a lot of speculation whether or not the Pope would be here or not for it. From what I understand, he will be here this year. But the interesting thing is, is the word mekodeshet to begin with. In Hebrew, the word mekodeshet is to espouse or to engage, to get engaged. It's like a marriage. Okay? So just keep that in mind. This one here, you probably think, what has this got to do prophetically? I know there's a lot of people saying right now about Donald Trump. Well, this is Cyrus and Darius to build the third temple. Well, I appreciate President Trump. I don't agree with him on everything. But... I appreciate him, and I'm going to share with you something that I shared with Rabbi Glick when we did the interview today, that I do believe that his administration is playing a key role in prophecy in the book of Zechariah, of all places. All right, so let's get right into the things we're going to be looking at here. As the sister that was speaking before me, she mentioned about Esau, Esau being the Romans. And I don't have the time to go into it, but I could take it down and show you biblically all the way from the time when David and, uh, uh, and King Saul, when they were fighting against the Edomites, trying to wipe out, in fact, one place in the book of Kings, it speaks about that they wiped out all the descendants of Esau, except one, and that was Hadad. Hadad ends up surviving, goes, he's raised in Egypt, is basically like the Pharaoh's son. It's almost like a, another story of Moses all over again, right? But he later, when David dies, he requests to go back to his homeland. He's married to, uh, marries the, king, the Pharaoh's uh, wife's sister, I believe it was. I may have that wrong. But anyway, marries her. But he doesn't go back to Edom. 
where it was here not far, you know, down towards uh, southern Israel, but he goes into Syria. And then the lineage begins to grow. And of course, the rabbis, the sages, we trace the, the, the lineage of Esau from there into northern Africa and then finally into Rome. But we can see it in the scripture as well because Obadiah clearly shows that Esau goes to Rome. And it's not just Obadiah. We find it in Ezekiel and other places as well. All right? But here's what's interesting. On this particular uh, 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 parasha blog spot, this particular rabbi, uh, Shadal, he's asking the question, about whether or not Edom equals to Rome and Christendom. And he says no. Now he goes completely against Ibn Ezra, he goes against Rashi, the great Torah commentator uh, that so many of us Jewish uh, Jews have read over the years and stuff, completely against what they had actually taught. Now, I'm not here to throw my Christian friends under the bus by no means by saying this, but I will say this here. There are many, no doubt, good Catholic people, there are many good uh, Christians in every denomination and many of them that stand with us but there's also a major growing anti-semitism that is flourishing inside churches today that I have never seen before in my life and it's it, and, 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 uh, and I'm just I don't really understand why it's going that way my wife will share more with you about that right there so Shadal says no contrary to what the sages have taught but here's what he does he does a very interesting thing he takes over with the story of Rebekah and the giving the birth of the sons Esau and Jacob, he quotes this in, uh, in Genesis uh, 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, two peoples shall be separated from thy bowels, and the people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. All right? Prophecy coming there. And again, he says, Should we take this as, as a prophecy to be applied nowadays and to the Messianic times? Shadal says, No. I disagree with him and I'll tell you why and I'm going to share with you about five different revelations that the, the Spirit of God has revealed to me here in the last two years and how they have unfold and I'll try to go very quickly for, to save on time let's go back to Baal let's go back to Genesis 25 and let's look at this once again all right now keep in mind a pregnancy as most women know lasts nine months give or take a few days I wouldn't want to go any longer because I know it's very difficult when he gets past the nine months. Uh, and the children struggled together within her. She said, if it be so, where do I live? She went to inquire of Hashem, and Hashem said unto her, two nations are in your womb, and two people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Esau and Jacob, all right? Now, keeping in mind, we know that Rome, clearly, historically, is the descendants of Adam. And it doesn't mean that everybody that lives in Rome and everybody that's a descendant of Adam is a bad guy either. It's the spirit. And we'll go into that as we go along here. But I want to share with you one of the first things that the Lord revealed to me. Remember when John Kerry, back in the, uh, I forget exactly the time, beginning around 2013 there, he decides that he wants to do a nine-month negotiation. You can look at it here on Wikipedia. Negotiations were scheduled to last up to nine months to reach a final status to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict by mid-2014. The Israeli negotiating team was led by veteran negotiator Justice Minister Zippy Livni, and while the Palestinian delegation was led by Saeed uh, Erekat. Now what's interesting is when the negotiations began, the Lord began to deal with me and he showed, it took me back in my heart and said, go back and look at Rebecca. It's two children are in the womb. It's a nine-month negotiation. But as the Lord revealed to me, it has nothing to do with the Palestinians. The Vatican is using the Palestinians in order to bring about their own agenda. And I'm like, this is pretty far out. And I remember when I first brought this out to the people, I said, you know, there's definitely, it's definitely it's something is going to happen. Well, everybody was looking for two states. But I knew that as if you go back, the late Barry Chamish, who was a good friend of ours, Joel Bainerman, the investigative journalist here in Israel, how many of you know about these guys here? They exposed the Oslo Accords. It was never about a Palestinian state in 1993, 1994. The late Shimon Peres, what was he doing? He was negotiating for Rome to give sovereignty over Jerusalem. And we can go all the way back 
to the League of Nations, 1920, 1922, when there was a, called a quote-unquote Palestinian mandate for a Jewish homeland. Well, 1920, we were thrown under the bus. They took everything, give it to uh, King Abdullah II as a prize for the Second World War, excuse me, First World War, for helping to fight to overthrow the Ottoman Empire. But in 1922, we were actually given everything west of the Jordan River. So as I was going to ask when we were doing the, when we were covering the United Nations meeting uh, in Paris, France, I wanted to ask uh, then uh, or, or the, the former Secretary of State, John Kerry, I wanted to ask him this one question, and that was, how do you expect us as a Jewish people to be able to trust the United Nations with your new Resolution 2334 that you did in December, and now trying to pass it with every nation gathered against us, when you can't keep your promise in 1920, 1922, and then in 1947 you revise it again, you divide the land up again after six years letting our people die in the Holocaust? No one was allowed to come to the, to the land that you said was for the Jewish homeland. But yet at that time, the, the British turned their back while the Egyptians came in, the Jordanians come in. And again, I, I don't fault them for that. But the thing is, is we can't trust you because you don't keep your own promises. And then they wanted to make Jerusalem an international city. That's what the Oslo Accords were about, 93, 94. It was to take and to give the Jerusalem as an international city, and even the leaks that were revealed by Barry Chamish and uh, Joel Bainerman proved that the Vatican was working with Shimon Peres to do exactly that. Okay, so now we move up. Things didn't work out quite the way Rome had hoped. And again, I'm not against the Pope. Even when he comes here and he holds the communion service up here, he has a right. I may not agree with him on his views, but he has a right to go there. It's a Christian site but you may be surprised to know that it was prophesied about as well in, by the prophet Obadiah. We'll get to that. All right, so let's back up a little bit, though. Guglielm Miyadi, he's been on Israeli News Live before. Uh, he's a writer for uh, Arut Shiva, Israel's, Israel National News. And Guglielm, he is a, an Italian man. He's not a Jewish man, but he stands very strong for Israel. He wrote an article here back in 2013, exclusive, A Seat for the Pope at King David's Tomb. And in this article here, he talks about that there had been a draft, without any resolution, by the way, to give an official seat in the room, in the, in the, la in the room of the Last Supper, is believed, were believed to have been taken place on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and where David and Solomon, Jewish kings of Judea, and are considered by some researchers to also be buried. It is in the culmination of a long campaign by the Catholic Church to, the, to regain religious stewardship over the place where... Jesus is supposed to have broken bread and drunk wine with his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion. Now, here's what's interesting. That's just to kind of set the stage of what was going on. Then we get this very interesting article here on the New York Times and many other publications. When the nine-month negotiation had kind of concluded, we get this articles all over the world, arc of a failed deal, how nine months of Mideast talks ended in disarray, just like the Oslo Accord. They had your mind somewhere else while they were busy all along. Isn't it ironic that less than 30 days later, after the nine-month negotiations had concluded, that the Pope of Rome goes here to the upper room and holds a communion service? The nine-month negotiations did not fail. And nowhere, nowhere does the Pope step that he doesn't conquer. He won't put his foot there unless he believes he's conquered it. Okay? Now, moving along. Notice, May 26, 2014, he holds a mass in the upper room. Now, let's take a look at some prophecy here. This is what I want to share with you real quick, though, when it comes to the Palestinian people, because to me, they're innocent in all this garbage that's going on that Rome is doing. You remember Daniel prophesies, especially the 23rd verse here, and after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, and he shall come up and become strong with a little nation. Now who's the he? The he is the prince that shall come that is spoken of in Daniel 9. And those of you that remember Daniel 9, uh, I think it's around verse 24 or so, it speaks about a prince that shall come. Now not the Mashiach, not the anointed prince, just a prince. And that prince will be of the people who destroy the temple and the sanctuary. So Daniel also shows you who it is. 
And we know Titus, the Roman general, came and he besieged the city, sacked it, ruined it, burned it, destroyed the temple, the temple as well. Now some would argue and they would say, no, it's the Syrians that did it. Well, let's see what he says then. Interesting, the Syrians did it. How is Esau searched out? How are his hidden places sought out? Again, so we can identify who it is. Esau, the descendants of Adam, right? All right, let's skip down just a little bit here. For thy violence, verse 10, done to thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Now remember, Esau himself, when he was alive on earth with Jacob, although he wanted to kill him, I never see anything other than when he was ready to go kill him, they made amends. So there could be amends, could be made. Okay? But notice this though, it's a prophecy, it's a spirit of Esau, it's a spirit of Edom that moves down into the days that we're living in now. In the day that thou didst stand aloof, in the day that strangers carried away his substance, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. Who? Esau. But just like the scholars are saying today, Chuck Missler, he's a uh, friend of ours, we've done an interview together before, and Chuck says, no, it's really not, it's not, it's not really the Romans, you know, it's kind of take the heat off of the Vatican, it was the Syrians. Well, sure, Rome had defeated the Syrians 50 years before the, uh, the siege of Jerusalem. They were letting them do the dirty work, but does not Obadiah say it as well? You stood aloof, you were as if you were one of them. Accessory after the fact. So Daniel 9 and verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall an anointed be, be one be cut off and be no more. And the people, as I was saying, of the prince that shall come, the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. I am wondering, could it be that the man that holds the communion service here is trying to be that prince that shall come? Anybody know about what the, the two keys on their flag? The Catholic flag, it represents both spiritual and temporal and uh, spiritual powers, and Rome will tell you we believe we, we're over both. I thought the scripture, I thought that the prophecy says that the ten people of the nations will take a hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, show us your ways, we hear God is with you. When there's a revival in this land, when there is a waking up of our people and Mashiach is here and we know who Mashiach is, that will send the revival. It cannot be a Mekodeshit. And again, I don't want to knock the Pope on it. I have to say, okay, I appreciate the fact that he's trying to bring about a reconciliation, but it's not God's provided way. Okay? Now, moving along, as we see, the, 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 this is what happened, that everything was destroyed. But thou shouldst not have gazed the day of thy brother in the day of his disaster, neither shalt have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldst thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldst not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldst not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldst thou stood in the crossway to cut them off. As it, and we continue on. For the day of the Lord, verse 15, is near upon all nations. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy dealing shall return upon thine own head. Now, here's what gets interesting. I made sure it was nice and big for everybody so you can see this one good. Verse 16. For as you have drunk upon my holy mouth, and so shall all the nations drink continually, yea, they shall drink and swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. Now that may seem like, okay, nice. Kika asha shutetem, masculine plural. Did you know that when the Pope of Rome had his communion service up here, it was men only? He was reenacting the Last Supper. I don't have a problem with that, but it's interesting, Obadiah prophesied about it. Kika asha shutetem. Men only are going to drink upon God's holy mountain. It was a communion service, right? You know, the reason I know it was men only, two things. The Vatican News that did the official coverage of it said it was him, his delegation, and the men that were here. And also he addressed them only as the brothers as well. But what's interesting is what it says next. Of course, al ha kodeshi upon my holy mountain, when you get right here, 
right there. That's drinking as well, but you know what's interesting about this way in Hebrew? It's gender inclusive. You might even say it's organization inclusive. And again, drinking there is not really, is not the issue. It's not an issue for Christians to take and have communion. It is a Christian holy site, right? And I don't have a problem with that either. But what's interesting is how that the prophet says they will do it, and then of course, the following weeks afterwards, they continued to do communion service in the upper room, both men and women, Greek and Roman Orthodox, and other types of denominations that came together that had communion service. And what was even worse, though, in my opinion, this is where it got cross, kind of crosses the line. The Jewish people were escorted out of King David's tomb on one of these communions, not when the Pope was here, but afterwards. They were taken out and told they had to leave by force. And then they conducted a communion service inside of the tomb of David. For most Jewish people, that's, you, just, you cannot do this. You literally, for, for the Jewish people, you know, it would be a wrong thing. But that's, now that's different. I'm not saying that it's wrong that it was actually done. What I'm trying to show you, though, is the fact that Obadiah prophesied that this was going to happen. But it gets more interesting. Let's move on. And again, you can see him right here. He's on the mountain. What, isn't it interesting? Of course, they say they, 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 without any referendum in Israel, the Pope of Rome is given an official seat, and they call it, as Guglielmo Miotti worded it, at King David's tomb. And the man has the audacity to put on, well, I know it's a fish hat, but I would call it a crown. The Mashiach is our king, not a man. You know, if, if he was a brother, you just shake his hand and say, God speed to you. That's one thing, okay? Now, again, we can skip. We, we went over this part right here. Again, here it is right here. Dear brothers, as he addressed the brothers that were there, look at any of the photos you want. Not a single girl in there. There are women there that are on the outside that are able to greet the Pope as he leaves. Now, let's move into Daniel here again, and let's look at a couple of verses real quick. I want to share, we're going to go into another prophecy, very interesting prophecies that also have taken place here. All right? This here? I, I wished I could. I don't know how to make, because it's in a PowerPoint. I apologize. Um, so, again... This, I actually brought this up just a little bit ago about how the, the Palestinians are being used. Uh, but notice up here in verse 21, And in his place shall stand up a contemptible person upon whom had not been conferred the majesty of the kingdom. But he shall come in a time of security and shall obtain the kingdom by blandishments or flatteries. And the arms of the flood shall be swept away from before him and he shall be broken. Yea, the prince of the covenant, again, is that prince that shall come. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, and he shall come up and become strong with a little nation. Notice the way it's worded, though. After the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. So the Israeli government gives him the official seat. They begin to give autonomy, right? And we're going we're gonna to drop back to that in just a moment. But I want you to think of something here. So Rome does come up strong, right? 2,000 years ago they did as well. Obadiah, verse 1, 13. Keep this in your mind. They laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. All right? Ezekiel, we're going to go into Ezekiel next, 35, 5. And they have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity. Just keep that in mind. All right, let's go to another article by Guglielmo Miotti. The Vatican wants to lay its hands on Jerusalem. All right? Now, in this article here, Guglielmo Miotti is quoting after the Pope has already been given the official seat here at King David's tomb in the upper room here. Then, right, be right when this article is coming out, we have an intifada starting up. And this is what Guglielmo writes. Peace negotiations in the Middle East must tackle the issue of the status of the holy sites of Jerusalem. Cardinal Jean-Louis Tron head of the Vatican's Council for Interreligious Dialogue, declared several days ago in Rome. The Vatican's former uh, uh, 
a minister asks, let me just drop down what he actually declares. There will be no peace if the question of the holy sites is not adequately resolved, Tehran said. The part of Jerusalem within the walls with the holy sites of the three religions is humanity's heritage. The sacred, unique character of the area must be safeguarded and it can only be done with a special international guaranteed statute. That he is referring to Resolution 181-1947, which gives a foreign entity control of Jerusalem. Not Palestinians, not the Jews, a foreign government. Now, he's like, basically, Jean-Louis Touran is requesting this control. That's what he's doing. And notice what he says, there will be no peace if the question of the holy sites is not adequately resolved. Did not Mahmoud Abbas say right there on television over there, we are here to safeguard the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock and our holy sepulcher. Working as one. All right? Now here's what's interesting. And we're going to look at this from a scriptural standpoint from Ezekiel 35. See, remember, Louis Toron, he says, there will be no peace if the question of the holy sites is not adequately resolved. Isn't it interesting that we had this third intifada has been called, labeled the knife intifada or the stabbing intifada. Now it may not make a lot of sense to you until you read Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 35 and verse 4 and 5. I, and by the way, if you look at all of Ezekiel and 35, again, it's dealing with Esau. It's dealing with Adam. So you know who's instigating the problem. And I, I will lay thy cities waste, thou shalt be desolate, Hashem is prophesying what he's going to do to Esau. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord. But watch what he says. Because thou hast had a hatred of old and has hurled the children of Israel unto the power of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of the iniquity of the end. Two different time frames. Two different time frames Ezekiel the prophet is prophesying that the children of Israel would be thrown to the power of the sword. Didn't Obadiah call it the time of our calamity at the destruction of the, uh, 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 of the second temple, 70 AD? Was it not the Romans? I didn't think they had any shotguns back then or machine guns or M16s or anything like that, so they were using the sword. Isn't it ironic? Now, I was here in the second intifada, survived in French Hill, the suicide bombing that was there, so I know what it's like with the bombs, but I did, I'm, thank God I didn't have to go with the knife intifada myself, but 171 stabbings that were actually conducted in this intifada. Why the sword? Why the knife? Well, I don't know, but Ezekiel seemed to know that it was going to happen. Okay? Now, about, and to prove to you the time of the iniquity, the time of the iniquity has an end. All we have to do is look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to forgive iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of the prophet, to anoint the most holy place. Wow. So we can see this already. We can see the time of the calamity, etc., from there. And as you can see, the famous pictures that are in the news everywhere, running through the streets with the knife in their hand, showing that it is at the time of our end that this antifada here is happening. And again, the statistics, 171 stabbings, 110 attempts, and 141 shootings. So the stabbing attacks outweighed it all. Now, real quick, just to let you know, any of us, we should have learned from history, but it doesn't seem like we ever learned from history. My wife will give you a good lesson on this one as well. But if we go back to the Maccabees, the book of Maccabees, we decided because we were having so much trouble with the Greeks, we would make a covenant with Rome only to have our city and the temple destroyed in 70 AD. So making a covenant with Rome is not the best idea that we could actually think of doing. And if you remember... God commanded Moses in Exodus 34, make no covenants with them when you come in the land. Okay? That was a, something we were supposed to know about. Now, to kind of save time, let's move on down. I want to go mainly to the last verse in Obadiah. Isn't it interesting here that it says here, and saviors, or deliverers, Moshoim, Moshoim, shall come up upon Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom shall be Hashem's. Now, Moshaim, this is more than one. Is it the two witnesses of Revelation 11? Maybe so. John Yochanan, was he not a Jew? Was he not a prophet? Did he not prophesy that there would be two witnesses? Maybe it's one and the same. Okay? 
That's, we'll see when that happens. But what's interesting is that those, I, I think King James people say it's deliverers, and deliverers shall come up on Mount Zion, this mountain here, to do what? To judge the Mount of Esau. Why is it called the Mount of Esau? Well, because you gave it to Esau. If the Israeli government gives it to Esau, it's Mount Esau. Okay? Now, there he is. Here's the other one. Another one the Lord revealed to me. Mekodeshit. It seems like a nice thing. Bring the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims together. That is a nice thing. Okay? But you have to understand what's behind it all. Daniel chapter 11, verse 14. All right? And in those times there shall, be, shall many stand up against the king of the south, also the children of the violent among thy people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision, but they shall stumble. So thank God, even though they're doing Mekodeshet, it is going to fall. And you might say, well, what has Mekodeshet got to do with this scripture here? Well, look at it in Hebrew. So Daniel, it's, it's the sons, you could literally say, the sons of the violent or the sons of the lawless of your people. So Daniel says, your own sons are going to try to lift up the vision or inasu, also you could say to marry the vision. We can use it as lift up, we can use it as to marry because inasu means to marry. It's the same thing. It's probably better translated as lift up, but in this case here, you could say marry. Isn't it odd that they name it Mekodeshet, engage or, in, or to espouse? I thought we're supposed to marry Hashem. What are we doing measure, marrying the church? What are we doing trying to marry the Muslims and the Christians? You know, oh my gosh, I can get on a roll on that. But the whole point is, is we're seeing prophecy being fulfilled right before our eyes. And the sons of the lawless, who are these sons of the lawless? Well, it's the ones that are working in the behind the scenes. Shimon Perez, you know, and, and I don't fault the man for what he has done. He, th he thought he did the right thing. But the whole point is, was we're not to divide the land. It's not a two-state solution. Rabbi Glick said up here in the interview with us and everything, it's one state, and there's equality in the state, like the United States. If you want to be a Muslim, you can be a Muslim. You want to worship the way you want to worship, you can worship the way you want to worship. That's the way it should be. So we don't need to try to marry a vision. But the question is, is what vision are they trying to marry? All right, this is what's very interesting. And notice, back in... Uh, last year, 2016, this is when Mekodesh started. Watch what the Pope is talking about. Time is closing now. The exaltation of Pope Francis. It was his year of mercy. He said, this is your last year. And in fact, when they met here, notice it says even here in the article here, the Mekodesh meeting was an interfaith gathering. History will be held. Leaders from Roman Catholic, Muslim, Jewish communities will gather in the old city of Jerusalem. No Baptists, no Methodists, no Pentecostals, Messianics, or anything else. Because why? You had your year of mercy. You're supposed to come back to Rome, right? Forget what Yochanan says, come out of her, my people, in Revelation 18.4, and be not partakers of her sins or her plagues. And by the way, it's also in the Tanakh about that as well for the Jewish people. Okay? So, here's the vision, though, that they're trying to marry. Right? Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end to sin, to forgive iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and profit and to anoint the most holy place. When we were here covering this for Israeli News Live, we were able to slip into one of the Mekodesh meetings. It was the reconciliation of repentance meeting. They didn't like it that the guy who organized it allowed us to come in. We asked what they were doing. They say, we are all repenting. We are reconciling our differences. We need to reconcile with Hashem. Yes, with each other, I agree. We need to reconcile with each other as well. But the thing is, is this is the vision that they're trying to marry. They're trying to do it without Eliyahu, who every Jew leaves the door open for Malachi, Malachi's prophecy of, of chapter 3 there in the... Christian Bible, I think you have it in chapter 4. But we're not doing it the right way. Okay? So, as we move on here, the Vatican wants the Temple Mount taken from the Jews. 
According to Gulio Miadio, his article on Arut Shiva there in 2015, Arafat declared, no one will succeed in removing us from our land, including Jerusalem and Palestinian flag will fly from the Temple Mount and from the churches of Jerusalem. And by the way, if you remember in right there in that prophecy there in uh, Daniel's prophecy chapter 9, it was to anoint the most holy place. Believe me, he would like to be the guy to help you put the temple together. But remember, as Rabbi Orali says, we are that temple. That's an Orthodox, Hasidic Jew that says we are the temple. See, that's the temple that needs to be dealt with first. All right? The Vatican PLO agreements have been signed to enable the eviction of the Jews from Jerusalem that follows a memorandum signed by the Palestinian and Vatican officials in 2000, which repeated the Vatican call for an international mandate to preserve the prosperity and identity and sacred character of Jerusalem. Again, they're trying to force Resolution 181 is what they're trying to do. So we are in a horrible predicament at this point right here. And just in closing here, let me just share some things with you guys. I think as a Jewish people, and I didn't have any help, my family, no help at all, because my family were either hiding that they were Jewish, didn't want us to know that we were Jewish, or whatever. But I would say that there's one thing, as a Jewish people, we have to recognize one thing. In 70 AD, we went into captivity for a reason. And it wasn't because we were such a great, wonderful people. We offered more sacrifices than any other time in history. So believe me, the offering the sacrifices, if it took away our sins, we should be here today. Something went wrong. And I want to just share with you a few things that we need to think about as Jews. Things that we should think about with this man, our Jewish brother, whose name was Yeshu. Many call him Yeshua or Jesus. I want to ask you this question about this man here. And think about this in closing here. Have you ever thought for a moment why the Romans put a crown of thorns on his head? Did we forget that Hashem spoke to Moses from an eighth Sinai, a thorn bush, from the midst of a thorn bush? Have we ever thought about the fact that when he took the clay and spit on the ground and made a mud pie and put it on the blind guy's eyes and told him to go wash over here in the pool of Siloam, it wasn't the waters of the pool of Siloam that made him well. Could it be that he was trying to show us something that the same God that formed man from the dust of the ground that the spirit of that God was here among us as well? How many things did we miss? He tells the woman at the well, if you knew who it was, that you, wouldn't, you, you would ask me for a drink that you don't come here anymore. Why then did Moses take the elders of Israel and go out and smite the rock? Not 38 years later where they spoke to the rock, but where he went out and they smote the rock and he said that they, bring, they brought and the waters came forth. And if the children of Israel didn't drink the water, they would have perished. What about today? What about 2,000 years ago when his side was pierced? As Rabbi Tobia Singer, by the way, who teaches the very things that I'm teaching you now, the difference is, is he won't go to the part of the Mashiach, but he knows me, we're friends, and he teaches these things himself because he watches our channel. But when it comes to that water, as Rabbi Singer says, he says, Steve, he said it, it wasn't that his side, he was pierced. That's not right in Zechariah 12. He was thrust through. I said, that's right. The Roman soldier thrust him through and water come from his side. There's your rock. There's your waters of life. And one last thing. Donald Trump, how many in here like Donald Trump? I tell you what, I don't say he's the greatest guy in the world, but I'll share one thing to you. He's a signpost. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 5. You know how it talks about Jerusalem becomes a burdensome stone? And we know this also shows how the house of Judah recognizes their Messiah too, right? But before they recognize their Messiah, there is a, there is a chief of Judah that arises that says in their heart, they make that interesting statement. He says in their heart, and I'll just have to paraphrase it now, that we know that if we will bless or, or stand with Israel, uh, Jerusalem, then God will, their, their, their God will stand with us. 
So it says chiefs of Judah. That's not the Knesset members. It's Alufi. Alufi in Hebrew means champion in modern Hebrew. The champions of Israel. Isn't it interesting? He has stirred up the entire world over wanting to move the, uh, the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He's caused a couple of trembling. The United Nations meeting here in France that just happened in 2017, that was also spoken where all the nations gather against Jerusalem. There it is there. Trump's administration say in their heart, because it's not politically correct, that they will stand with the God of Israel because they know they'll be blessed by it. Take the time to go back and read it. Verse 5, chapter 12 of Zechariah. And you will see that his administration, regardless of their political view, is fulfilling a prophecy that happens just before the house of Judah recognizes her Mashiach. Thank you.